I, I was having a chat with Afshin last week, and, and he wanted me to say two things to you. One um, was that his story is completely not extraordinary, in his opinion. Um, there are many Afshins. There are many people like him. Uh, and, and, and I think Richard can attest to this. He found nothing remarkable about his own life and his own journey. And the second thing he wanted to say was that after having lived in Europe and performed in Europe for the last five years, what he's found is that there is a lot more dancing in Iran than there is in the West. Um, <laughs> that Iranians dance hell of a lot more. Um, and, and here it seems to be designated to nightclubs and very specific times, where in Iran people dance at any time and all the time, whenever they get an opportunity. And funny enough, while you guys were watching this and we were out, I was on Twitter and Facebook, and my feed was flooded with videos and images from Iran of people dancing in the streets. Um, having said that, um, obviously, as you saw this film, this film is not about uh, politics, it's about people. And it's about, you know, and, and despite of what happened today, much of the circumstances that existed in Iran, the people who are still in jail, the restrictions that existed still exist, haven't changed, and the people are still going through the same thing. So one of the things that I wanted to ask you as we go into this next segment of this is that what we want to talk about is the film, what we want to talk about is the things that have informed the film, um, the story of the film, and once we open up the Q&A, I would really appreciate it, as well as uh, Richard and Nina would appreciate it if we kept the comments and conversations and questions away from the nuclear deal. None of us here are equipped or qualified to have that conversation, especially, uh, uh, you know, we felt on that part. None of us, to be honest with you. And so this is not what this is about, and we'd appreciate it if you'd sort of focus on the film and the issues around the, around the film and, and also your thoughts on it. Um, so thank you. Um, I wanted to introduce you to uh, Dr. Nina Ansari. If you ha haven't heard from her, you should. Um, and uh, a little bit about her. Born in Tehran, Nina Ansari left Iran in 1979 and has not returned since. She received her BA from Barnett College, her MA in Middle Eastern Studies from Columbia University, and her PhD in History from Columbia University. She serves on the Middle East Institute Advisory Board at Columbia University, on, uh, on Columbia University's Global Leadership Council, and on the Board of Trustees of the Iran American Women's Foundation. She's a member of the American Association of University Women, the National Organization of, for Women, NOW, and U.S. National Committee for UN Women. Her upcoming book, Jewels of Allah, the Untold Story of Women in Iran was inspired by her scholarly journey, journey and illuminates the stereotypical assumptions of women in Iran today. In fact, what's, what I found really interesting, we were having lunch this, this, early this afternoon, and I found out that every single penny that's going to be made from this book is actually going um, to organizations that are directly working with women in Iran, such as uh, Odi Omid Foundation, and I... And I was really remark it was, it was just couldn't believe it, that, you know, everything she's donating uh, to the cause, and, and that's been a testament to her, her career and everything she's done. And we're really excited to, to have her here. She's a regular contributor to Daily Beast, so you should check out her writings there. The Huffington Post, Women's E-News, and award-winning news websites, uh, which have recently honored her as one of the 21st, 21 leaders of the 21st century. She's one of the top influences on Iran on Twitter, so definitely follow her there. And has amassed over 200,000 followers in a very, very short period of time. And of course, the man of the hour, Richard Raymond, um, was born in London. He's not from Iran. <laughs> um, you know, Richard has an interesting background. As a, as a filmmaker, as a fellow filmmaker, I envy his background because I grew up in Iran. There was no Pinewood Studios. But, but Richard snuck into Pinewood Studios because he wanted to be a filmmaker at a, at, at a very young age as a teenager and learn a trade from the ground up, which is something that's quite rare these days, obviously. Um, so he's had an experience of film that's been quite authentic. Um, and I think his emotional connection to the stories that he tells, and I, I think it's very quite evident in his film, um, and much appreciated. He established himself as a regular face uh, at Pinewood and really began to work and learn at a time in which there was no 
um, internet and Twitter and Facebook so he could just sneak in and just pretend like he belonged there and he, uh, and he learned his trade in that way. Um, he produced the film in 2009, the same year uh, that much of this story takes place and this is his debut feature which is quite remarkable. Um, Richard lives in Los Angeles right now, he's from London originally. And without further ado, I invite the two of them here for a conversation, following with a Q&A with you guys. Yes. Congratulations, Richard. Um, Desert Dancer, um, the stunning uh, directorial debut of Richard Raymond. Can we have a round of applause? For uh, Richard, congratulations again. How difficult was it to make this movie? <laughs> Think of the most... It, it wasn't difficult to make the film. It was difficult to, to be able to get it made. Uh, I think it was... The hardest thing I've ever done in my life was to be able to raise enough money to make this film. It took a long, long time. It took thousands of people telling me no. It took thousands of people telling me no one, uh, no one would be interested in the story about Iran or the Iranian youth. Um, I came up against many obstacles from all over the world. It just, and, and you know, getting a film um, like this made, especially when it's your first film, is I can contest. It's very similar to pushing an immensely heavy rock boulder up a mountain, and when you just get to the top, it rolls all the way back down again. And that will happen about 30,000 times. And it just keeps rolling back down. And, and honestly, if it, wasn't, if it weren't for my family and my friends and the cast picking me up half of the time, it, you know, I needed their support to keep this going. It's definitely a team effort. But once I had met a... Um, once I had asked everyone on the planet, apart from about 24 people, um, those 24 people said yes, and, um, and some gave $10,000, some gave half a million, some gave $20,000, some gave more. And they all came together because they had each had one thing in common. They had felt oppression in their life, and they have a passion for the art, and a passion for how art can free you, can free anybody from an oppressed situation. And they saw a reflection in their lives and in their beliefs in Afshin's story. And, um, and if it were not for those people, and then relativity coming on board, um, this would be there. So everything from the moment the film got greenlit was a complete joy. Um, but everything before that was a living hell. Well, um, you know, the movie makes many powerful statements. First and foremost is, despite the reg current regime in Iran, how uh, the op an oppressive atmosphere cannot stifle creativity, nor extinguish artistic expression and passion. The other thing that comes to the forefront is how uh, many of us tend to sometimes take for granted the freedoms we have not living in oppressive societies, and it really brings that to the forefront in a, in a spectacular way. So. Absolutely, and we were having lunch today, and we would, one of the things that interested both Nina and myself was the quality and the texture of art that comes from oppressed situations and oppressive societies. And, I, I, and we, find this, we both found this fascinating. That's right, that's right, that how art translates differently uh, when you're in a liberating atmosphere as opposed to, well, you know, in the movie, uh, Elah, his mother, was uh, able to dance with the Iranian National Ballet Company, which was uh, really, uh, uh, you know, came about during the Pahlavi era and the era of modernization in Iran. And you could see uh, the pain that uh, transfer, transferred to her mother after the ballet company was shut down. And that how that pain translated in Elahe uh, through her art. You know, she was able to manifest that pain in her own artistic expression. So that was, it was the ripple effects of, of uh, artistic expression from a liberating era into an oppressive atmosphere from mother to daughter, and that was very powerful. Absolutely, thank you. The, with Alahe and Alahe's mother in particular, that story, because it's almost like there are two films within this film. There is the story, and which would make another great film. Alahe's story would, is an incredible story. Her mother 
was a dancer of the National Ballet, uh, and it was closed, or a great dancer, it was closed down in 79 at the height of the Iranian Revolution. And she was told, you know, you're not allowed to dance anymore. And here is a woman, a young woman, with an incredible gift, and suddenly it's shut, you're not allowed to dance. So um, she had no one to turn to, she had nothing to do, and she turned to drugs. And um, a, a lot of people say that the streets of, um, of the cities in Iran are flooded in the underground for, with, with, um, with crack and with heroin. And she turned to drugs to numb the pain of not being able to feel, not being able to express herself. And, um, and then when she got pregnant, she had the child and taught that child, gave that child the same mm -hmm. curse that she had, was this incredible skill of how to dance. Mm -hmm. But behind closed curtains and when the mother died of a heroin overdose, the daughter grew up addicted to, but with nowhere to show this, with nowhere to show this, show her ability. And so her dance, Elahe's dance, is, is how she feels. The choreography of her dance is her life story told, the covering and the drugs and everything that you see in her dance is her life story. And we use dance as the narrative of her life story. And it's a tragedy. Um, you know, another thing that um, the movie brings to the forefront is how you have pockets of beauty uh, that emerge out of darkness, out of a dark period, and how resilient Iran's youth are. Uh, you know, you have, it really humanizes Iran because the regime has been at the forefront again uh, for 35 years, so it is, has such a real and human, you know, really showcases how the citizens of Iran do not reflect the regime nor the discriminatory laws. Absolutely, there's there's something I I, I, I talk to Afshin regularly, and there's um, when when those kids in Iran were arrested for dancing to Pharrell's "Happy," that, that's terrible. But just as bad is the headlines across Europe and America that that says in big letters, "There's no happiness in Iran." You know, because we demonize an entire country, an that's entire right. society, when that's not true. That's not true at all. Like you were saying, it's dancing. there's so much dance in Iran. That's right. But it's, it's just, it's, 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 it's more, com Iran is a very complex country, and as an outsider looking in, I can say that. And I feel that, you, know, you were talking about, um, about beauty, but you know, it's funny, in cities you can never see the stars, because it takes real dark to see stars. And I always like that metaphor. And I think that sometimes the most beautiful things, and I try to reflect it in the poetry of the cinema, come at times of great darkness and great sadness. That's right, that's right. And wanted to reflect that. That's right, and we were talking also about how uh, there's so many other beautiful uh, pockets that have emerged out of this dark period, which a lot of people don't realize. And, and, and uh, such as you know the women's rights movement, we were talking about that as well. Uh, we were talking about artists, painters, uh, who are translating this oppression onto their onto the canvas, yeah. and how that's making infiltrating its way out of Iran and sending another powerful message. Absolutely, it is. There are so many examples of how oppression creates great art. But when we were talking today, there was um, there's an interesting theory about the flip side of that, which is how does an Iranian dance when he now has the right to. Yes. And I think, and that's the, it's the biggest challenge of Afshin's life. Can you career. elaborate on that? Because that for me, uh, I had never thought about that, how someone like Afshin, who is just a stunning dancer, can come to Paris where he's got freedom, and how is he able now to dance in the same manner and express his oppression, because there is no oppression. Yeah. And, his, and his dancing came out of his, uh, you know, it's a, it was a liberating measure for him. Well, so. you can look at Nureyev, uh, you can look at, you know, coming from the Soviet Union, you can, there are so many examples of great artists of our time coming from oppressed situations. Would they have been the great artists of our time had they have not come from oppressed situations? Is always, always a fascinating question and a good debate to have. I find that when I met Afshin, he was an angry young man. And today, he's not like that at all. He's, he's, um, he's grown up, he's, 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 he's finding a new voice. Um, there isn't cause for him 
to continue the voice of protest through dance. When I met Afshin, he was doing multiple, and they're all on the internet, all these uh, festivals in France, all these talk shows, all these um, uh, uh, appearances and all these performances where dance was his protest. And that's what we replicated at the end of the film. That's what Afshin became very known for, was using dance as a weapon. That was his saying, dance is my weapon. He was, and he even admits it today, he was an angry young man for the, from the situation that he came from. However, what we were just talking about before, how does one exist? When, how does one find, what is one's voice when you no longer are defined, when your art is no longer defined by oppression? And so that's the biggest challenge that Afshin has been facing today and for the last three or four years. He, he wants to find his own voice as an artist and he's on that journey now. And um, you can look at his videos on YouTube. He has a, um, uh, a, a dance company called Reformances. They're on Twitter. He's on Facebook. All his videos are online. And they're very different now. He has one called Le, Cry, um, Le Persian Cry, which is similar to protest dance. But his dances after that are pretty out there. They're not, they're not protest dance. And, but he's finding his voice. And I, don't, I always think it's um, not fair. I mean, I've been... I'm 37, I've been trying to be, uh, uh, I've been learning to be a film director since I was 15 years old, but it's taken me 22 years to find my voice, you know? So it's, I, I think it's unfair to, um, to, to, to pressure somebody to, to know who they are so quickly. And remember, Afshin and his friends learned how to dance on YouTube. <laughs> you know, this is, you know, and, it, and what we don't show in the film, because it would be dramatically boring, is that it took 12 hours to download through the proxy service just one YouTube video. I was going to bring yeah. that up. I yeah, was going man. to say with all the blockages. Yeah, the, the yeah. proxy service slows it down right there. Sometimes they would have to use two proxy servers. And yeah, can you imagine? That would not be good. <laughs> we could get away with, with the dissolve, but still. Um, and so... And so basically, it, it was, they were up against it, and they weren't great. And that's what made it so special, is they weren't great dancers. And, and that's what we tried to replicate with the actors. We chose actors that had no dance experience whatsoever. Uh, I mean, Frida Pinto did a little boogie at the end of Slumdog Millionaire. But, but she dedicated herself, 12 months of training. Reese Ritchie had uh, experience in martial arts, had no dance experience professionally. Tom Cullen, who played Ardy, um, he, had, he had some physical theatre training, so we used those things so they wouldn't be perfect dancers. Right, it was raw dancing, but yeah. it was, you know, dancers with no formal training. Yes. And that, you know, and that's the reality of anyone who wants to dance in Iran. There is no formal training. Yes, So, exactly. And that was, really came through in the movie, which, which is wonderful, because if you had them dancing in a professional capacity, the audience would be left to wonder, how is that possible? Absolutely. And the other thing is, today, there are dance classes in Iran, but you have to look for the door that says aerobics. <laughs> or you have to look for the door that says netball. That's that, or or hip-hop classes, I think, are basketball practice. You know, it's all that world... Oh, coded. Yeah. coded. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Of course. Um, that just makes it all the more exciting as well. For them. But I think it's, um, but it's interesting, that, that seamless that seamless boundary between the door, the, the, the world behind the closed door and the, the world outside the doors. That you are. And we were talking about the history, you were talking to me about the history of dancing. You know, you art. mentioned, right, the history of dancing, you know, because dancing has been banned in post-revolutionary Iran, many people don't realize that the origin and the rise of uh, the art of dance in Iran dates back to actually the birth of Mithraism, which was the religion that spread across the Roman Empire between the first and fourth centuries. And actually dancing as an art form developed during the first Persian Empire, the Achaemenid, and continued with the Parthian and the Sasanids. So that is an area where historians actually call the forgotten history of Persian dance. So something that's banned in the t in today actually flourished, you know, thousands of years ago in Iran. A country that, when you walk into the UN, there's the cylinder of Sirius the Grand. There it is, the first charter of human rights. That's right. That's it's right. the country that gave birth to the greatest poets of our time. That's right. And so, and the irony that something as innate, something as natural as dance, mm -hmm. um, is looked at as vulgar, yes. for, uh, is is just insanely stupid. <laughs> well, there's a lot of irrational laws that that, that are just continuing in Iran, hopefully, hopefully, yeah. we can hope for change. I think the, the one thing I want to say before we 
would do questions yeah. is that the um, is that the most important thing I wanted to talk about is the fact of why I chose to make this film in English, and I think it's important for me to communicate that the plight of the Iranian people is known only too well by the Iranian people. And there are millions and millions of young people in this country and in my country and in France and in Germany and in South America, Australia, South Africa that have no interest in watching an art house film set in Iran in Farsi. And I felt it was a much more positive mission to tell a story in the language of dance. Forget the fact that it's in English, actually the language of the film is in dance, but to tell a film that would be accessible to those people in a way that they would want to go and see the film, and then by the end of the movie, they would a doorway is open to some positive awareness. And I'm not from Iran. I love Persian food, and I know how to say chai maham. But, <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's not my. I, I I don't have the right to make a film in Farsi. And I just felt I discovered the story, and I had a passion for it. But I felt it was the right thing to do to cast. 60, 50, 60 percent of, um, of Iranian actors and the rest are from actors from all over the world. A lot of people say, oh, Frida Pinto's from India, but Tom Cullen's from Wales, you, uh, Reese Ritchie is from the UK with South African parents. No one questions whether he's from Iran. And it's just, so it's just great actors in the best, in the best roles from all over the world to enhance that belief that it's a universal story for everybody. Thank you. Okay, so let's go to questions. Um, I'll, I'll try to catch you and give you a mic so that uh, the video can pick you up. Uh, here we go. Thank you so much for the great movie. The music was incredible, especially the drumming in the desert. And also, of course, Suzanne Day hymn song. Yes, Suzanne. It yes. was gorgeous. What was the drumming? And, and also, the, both in the de during the desert dance and also uh, and during the last part, when he was using his feet. I think the, the important thing to talk about is Suzanne. We went to her house here in Encino and showed her and her husband Richard a, an early cut of the film and they were moved to tears. And, I, and she said, what do you want me to do? And, and Benjamin Wolfish, the composer, who um, is my brother in filmmaking in a sense, um, we, he said to her, please just think of home, think of your friends, think of the plight and just improvise. And so in a sense, what we had with Suzanne is the voice of Iran. Was, was the creative voice of the country, and then from that we could build onto it. All the drums were Persian drums. Um, I forget the name of the Persian drum. I'm sure someone... Daft. Yes, there were many dafts. We, we, we found every, every um, Persian musician we could find in London and in Los Angeles was playing in this film. And I think um, we, uh, it, it, was, it, was in, it was important for it not to be an Iranian soundtrack, but to feel that it was from there, but also for, for the rest of the world. It, it, I didn't want it to to feel like a Persian soundtrack. I wanted it to feel emotional. I wanted to use the language of a cinematic score to allow people to emotionally connect to the film. At the same time, have the right balance of the right sounds from Iran. But it, 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 the soundtrack, I'm so proud in it. The soundtrack comes out, I think it comes out in a couple of days, and we just had the first reviews today. And it's just amazing to see some great five-star, four five-star reviews for Ben Wolfish. Um, he's an incredible man, and um, and uh, it's the beginning of a great career for him. I hope. I'm sure. But thank you very much. Um, my name is Tokhtaba Buzari. I'm actually uh, from Mashhad, the place that Afshin is from, and uh, was born and raised there. So, I wanted to thank you so much for making such a beautiful film. Because before I come to this film, I thought you know it's um, another story from Iran, but made. Uh, by a non-Iranian uh, director, but also uh, the actors, the main actors are not from Iran. And I thought definitely I'm not going to like feel, um, you know, feel connected with the, the whole thing because I would think the energy of the people are different and like maybe Iranian, we, we feel kind of another story that, you know, supposed to be good, but not really. I am so moved and so thankful how beautifully you made this film that no matter um, beautiful acting, beautiful, you know, beautiful made that it was very, very close to the, to the truth, to whatever we had without really thinking uh, where, where each person or actors are from. And we could feel that struggling and um, feel the whole things. Thank you so much. I just want to be so thankful. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. 
that, that means a lot to me. Um, I have to thank, um, she only has one scene in the film. Uh, others had to be cut out for pace, um, but Nazanin Bonyadi, who's also is a friend of Nina's, and she is official spokesperson for Amnesty uh, USA, and she's a warrior for the rights for women in Iran. And she, over year, the last three years, taught me everything. <laughs> like, um, and, and, and if it wasn't for her support, I don't think we would have been able to put as much truth into the film as possible. Um, can we also, uh, for those who don't know, say who Nazanin played in the movie? She played his mother, Parisa Gafarian, um, one scene at the beginning of the film. There were others, but it, um, but for pacing reasons, um, we had to cut them, and I'm still apologizing to this day. But, um, but she was, she really helped with the film, because um, it's frightening. Because I think why tonight is so important a lot of people are going to think how, what you thought. You know, it's not an Iranian director, it's shot in Morocco, this is not authentic. And I, and, and I think that what we're hoping is that, is that people's perceptions will change because they've seen the film and spread the word and give it a chance and give, uh, give other people a chance to experience the film. Because a movie like this is not going to have billboards up and down Sunset convincing people to go and see it. It's all going to, going to be people discovering it. And today, that's a very authentic thing to happen because every it's all about marketing today, but this isn't about that. We, we, we were told when the trailer first came out, we were talking about this earlier, um, that Relativity said to me, oh, you know, look, it's a small movie. We're going to back it all the way, but if we could get like maybe 250,000 views of the trailer, that would be amazing. Well, okay, so we're keeping our fingers crossed, and a month and a half later, we've just hit 10 million. And that's all from people, groups of people, and a lot of Iranians, passing the trailer around to groups of their friends saying, you should watch this, you should watch this. So I'm hoping that people can t in, in become our warriors and to, and to pass this on. And, and that would say a lot about society today if, if that were to happen. The movie sends such a powerful message. It's such a, from a, even a humanitarian perspective. So even if you're not, um, you know, if you're any, any way connected to humanity, it sends, you know, you should be talking about this movie. Uh, hi. Um, could you talk a little bit about the process of writing the screenplay? Did you sat with Afshin and just uh, went through his life story? Did you got other source material and stuff? Thank you. Sure. The writer of the film is not me. The, the writer is John Croker, who's an incredible young writer in, based in London. Um, John and I worked very closely together with Afshin. Uh, we went, you saw the clip at the end of the film of Afshin talking. There's eight hours of that, and we went to Paris multiple times and spoke to him, and one of the times that we went, we took a video camera with us. So that interview is from 2010, and we just recorded eight hours of him talking about his entire life. And, and that happened about two or three day, times, and we then had his entire life in front of us up until he was 22, 23 when we met him. And we just broke it down into cards, and we, and we broke it down. And obviously, it's not a documentary. It is a movie. It is based on his true life story. But we had to... Con the Desert Dance actually happened in 2007. You know, so we've had to... It, the whole, his whole story, apart from the childhood, takes place in three years. We've condensed it into one year. And we've had to take creative liberties to really just be able to tell his story in the way that we've told it. But never once have we veered away from the truth everything in there and there's a couple of instances where specifically it didn't happen to Afshin but they did happen to thousands of other young Iranians so in the sense of that where we didn't tell Afshin's story we told the story of the Iranian youth and we've all John and I felt are the heroes of the film in a sense um, but it was but with independent films it's always difficult because you can never film the screenplay that you wish you could film because you always have um, you always have issues but there's something about the innocence of making mistakes and not being able to 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 shoot what you set out to shoot, and it's somehow the alchemy, it worked. But yeah, it was an interesting process. Hi, Richard. Um, I, I really also just want to thank you very much for caring about an Iranian boy's story so much, and having the passion to go through that hell stage that you speak of, and making it through to the other side. It's really, I'm so, deeply, deeply touched by um, your being touched by the story. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and you know, one of the aspects was that the, 
that took place during the Green Revolution, and you know, it's been years since then, and people cared about that for about five minutes, non-Iranians, but you continued to care about it, and you know, remind us again, and remind non-Iranians of what took place in Iran, what opened for a small period of time. But do you imagine that what's happening today would have happened be if it were not for that? You know, it's, it's, it's very, I, I, everything is cause and effect. And I think even though it was um, squashed, even though it was, cr you know, as the, the regime said, it was crushed, that rippled, that, that rippled, and it affects, it affected everything and, and in a positive way. They're just, it, I was so affected by the protests there because it was before the Arab Spring. But here's a, here's a country and here's a people that even though, you know, 121 young Iranians were killed on the streets, the, the, and the government says you will not make noise, you will not have a noisy protest. What happens the next day? A million youth in silence outside the television station. That's incredible. That's what happens when you have a fiercely educated population protesting, you know. And I, I was really inspired by that. And, but it's, you know, it's impossible to forget what happened. And um, it's, but it's absolutely not a political film at all. I know nothing about politics. I just know about people and, um, and, and, and how wonderful these people are. And um, that's the connection. Because the only thing I believe in in the world is that we're all the same, is that we're all human beings. And when you go into space, you don't see borders, you don't see cultures, you just see one. And, I just, and that's my overriding belief in everything in life. And I just feel that um, that's why I want to do it in English as well, I guess. So people would just see how similar we all are. We love the same music. Well, thank you all. Um, thank you, Alina and Richard. Uh, thanks to you. Um, I think Richard touched on this when he was talking, in that um, those of you who are familiar with Iran, who have uh, people on social media who know you know the country, your voice is critical. And this is why this was a really important screening for us and an important conversation. And, and nothing is, piques interest more than a debate and a conversation. I urge all of you, uh, whatever you feel at the end of this film, let it not end on the screen. Let it be a beginning of a conversation, especially now um, that uh, things are beginning to seem hopeful. It is, it is, it is now most important of all uh, to talk about this film and the people in this film and the people who continue to live in the same circumstances as those of this film. Thank you, Richard. Thank, Thank you. you, Nina. Thank Thanks you. to all of you. Thank you.